Hey. What's up, guys? I'm live. I've never done this on my own. This is very exciting. I did it on Lily's thing with Lily occasionally, but I've never uh, done it on my own, so I guess I am doing it correctly, though. Hello. Hey, Hopper. Ow. Oh, hello. Oh, hey, Roxanne. I know you. <laughs> um, Roxanne worked at my physical therapy place after I tore my Achilles tendon. I had to get physical therapy, and she worked at the place I got physical therapy at. Oh, my God, Netflix is here. Um, and then that place closed down um, before all this, but it was sad. Um, what's up, Daddy? What's up, hip bin? Hello, hello. I miss you too, Roxanne. Um, anyway, hey guys, how's it going? Um, uh, I mean, I can't imagine that the, that it's going great. Um, you know, it's a weird thing we're living in right now. How's isolation? Any tips? Um, I mean, yeah, is everybody washing their hands and socially distancing and hopefully even shelter and placing and quarantining and stuff? Um, we're trying to do that the best we can. We're uh, still going out, um, to get, uh, hey, Garrett Dillahunt, wow. <laughs> um, we're still, Garrett Dillahunt's a great actor, a far better actor than I am, um, so it's an honor that he's watching me get live. Um, I, uh, we still go out to get groceries and stuff. Um, and occasionally some supplements that will probably not help us, but, um, we live in the delusion that they will. Um, but yeah, we're pretty much hunkered down. I mean, you know, I was in, uh, New York city and, um, Lily and her kids, Lily's my girlfriend, she has two daughters and they were in London and, um, you know, when it all started to go down, I, uh, I was going to stay in New York in my apartment alone and I was there for a couple days, um, and I was getting pretty squirrely and we would FaceTime and stuff like that and she wanted me to come over, but I thought it was irresponsible to fly um but at a certain point i just uh at a certain point i saw de blasio speak about shelter in place and um i just knew that if this thing went on and on i just couldn't not be with her and her kids uh and so i just i just packed a bag and i went straight to the airport and i bought a ticket and um well i I took a shower and washed my hands when I went and I stayed away from as many people as I possibly could. And I took some disinfectant wipes and I just got on that plane and I just came over to London um, as safely as I could. But I sort of had to be with her and the kids during this time. Um, and then when we got here, um, we drove out to the country because she has a... Uh, friend who lives out here in the country and he's graciously allowing us to stay in his guest house so we have some places to walk around and get some fresh air um so i just want to say like to my fellow new yorkers like i was ready to hunker down but i uh if i didn't have lily and the kids i would be there with you but um you know what you guys are going through is extremely difficult i mean now it seems like New York is the epicenter of the crisis, but I know that it is handling it pretty extraordinarily as well. I love de Blasio's uh, updates. Um, I watch them. I know New Yorkers are super strong. It's the reason why I love that city so much. Um, and Lily couldn't come over there with the kids because of different reasons, so I had to be here. But I miss New York. I miss you guys. Um, I'll be back as soon as I can. Um, anyway, let me read an article so we can start off this 
live with just some kind of because I do find that a lot of these things, you know, I mean, a lot of it is my own kind of, uh, you know, a bunch of celebrities being narcissistic, like we can do anything. And instead, I do like to read articles and to get some sort of information out there that is interesting and that has research to it and that has some substance to it before we go off into all the other stuff. So I become very interested in pandemics in general, because I feel like when I talk to people now, like all my uh, friends, we're all like first year sociology students in college or something where we, uh, we talk about a lot of theories and we know nothing. And I feel like that's the whole world right now. I mean, you know, um, at every level, I think that people don't understand what we're dealing with or, you know, and there's people out there that think it's the end of the world, zombie apocalypse. And then there's people that think it's no big deal and there's everything in between. Um, and so I'm very curious about pandemics and I'm very curious on a larger sort of macro level, what a pandemic is going to mean in the future. Um, and so I'm very interested in the history of pandemics. So this was an amazing article I read in the Times today, um, or was it today, or a couple of days ago? Um, how New York, uh, is an opinion piece by Mike Wallace. Um, he wrote a book called Greater Gotham, A History of New York City from 1898 to 1919, from which this article is adapted. Um, how New York survived the great pandemic of 1918, better than many cities, it turns out. In 1918, New York went up against an influenza pandemic that ranks among the worst in world history. The way our forebears responded to that crisis might be of interest now as the city deals with the coronavirus onslaught. The virus arrived on August 11th, 1918, aboard the Norwegian vessel Bergensvjord. Don't speak Norwegian. The ship had wired ahead that 10 passengers had taken ill and three had died. It was met at the pier by ambulances and health officers who whisked the sick to Brooklyn's Norwegian hospital. On August 16th, the new Amsterdam out of Rotten, uh, Rotterdam made landfall, bearing 22 stricken. And on September 4th, the French liner Rochambeau brought in 22 more. The city's Department of Health placed the afflicted in isolation at the Willard Parker 34th. Um, Willard Parker Hospital on East 16th and the... Oh my God, I'm back. Am I back? Oh my God, that was horrible. Mm. Okay, I think I'm close to the internet now in this house. Um, all right, I think this is better. I think I can continue now. Sorry about that. I don't I don't know where the internet is. Now I'm kind of figuring it out, like walking around like a, one of those guys who find water or whatever with a stick. I'm like that guy with the Wi-Fi. Um, you're going to get a very moody thing with a, ooh, an oil painting in the background. This is really stepped up or down a notch. I'm not exactly sure, but we've certainly got more in. Oh, there's the nice, disgusting glow of the blue light from the computer. That makes me look gorgeous. Um, I love you so much too, Flowed Haster. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. Uh, Department of Health placed the afflicted in isolation at Willard Parker Hospital on East 16th and the French Hospital on West 34th. On September 15th, the first death from what was being called the Spanish influenza was recorded. There was nothing Spanish about the supremely contagious disease. It was rampant among all Europe's combatant armies and countries, but underreported due to military censorship, except in neutral Spain, where coverage was unchecked. On September 17th, Royal S. Copeland, a homeopathic physician who in April had been appointed the city's health commissioner, required doctors to report instances of flu and pneumonia. The number of cases began multiplying rapidly, as did the daily death toll. On September 30th, physician reports, physician reports showed that 48 people had died the previous day, and they were hard deaths, with patients gasping for breath as their lungs filled with bloody, frothy fluid. 
As often as not, flu victims were finished off by pneumonia, a secondary infection that followed closely upon the flu virus's trail, constituting a lethal one-two punch. In October, the pandemic struck with full force. On October 4th, physicians reported 999 new cases during the previous 24 hours. Um, on October 9th, that doubled to 2,000. On October 11th, the count rose to 3,100. The next day, there were 4,300 new instances. And on October 19th, 4,875 new cases were tallied. Fatalities followed along. On October 6th, 126 died. 297 perished the following day. Over 400 succumbed on October 16th, and the daily death count fluctuated between 400 to 500 from October 16th to the 26th. On October 30th, Mayor John Hyland dispatched 75 men to the Cavalry Cemetery to help inter bodies that had overflowed the facility's receiving vault. Um, and in happier news, this is Lily. Right, I burnt our baked potatoes. She burnt our baked potatoes. Um, One second. Um, <laughs> not going to hit me, are you? Not <laughs> just trying to read a, a serious article. No, I know, but, but no. what should I do? Because at joint pleasure, should I just make salad? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Anything okay. to eat is great. You don't need potato. I don't need potato, no. Okay. I'm good, salad's great. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. Copeland's Department of Health opted for a two-part response to the epidemic, attempting to slow the spread of the disease and treat and treating the infected. The containment strategy redeployed public health measures worked out in New York's New York over previous decades. In the course of dealing with various infectious diseases, notably cholera and tuberclo tuberculosis, the first line of defense was isolation of the ill. As Copeland explained to the New York Times on September 19th, when cases develop in private houses or apartments, they will be kept in strict quarantine there. When they develop in boarding houses or tenements, they will be promptly removed to city hospitals and held under strict observation and treated there. In practice, home quarantine was voluntary, given the lack of sufficient number of physicians to oversee compliance, and hospital quarantines may have separated the sick from the general population but couldn't isolate them from one another. Bellevue patients were laid out on cots, jammed together in every nook and cranny. Children were packed, three to a bed. Other venues were pressed into service, armories, gymnasiums, and the municipal lodging house, which was converted from a homeless shelter to sick bay for the duration of the epidemic. Hard-hit military installations like Camp Mills, Camp Disc, uh, Dix, and Camp Upton set up their own facilities. Upton hospitalized over 100 new patients every day between September 15th and October 9th. Admissions peaked at 483 on October 4th in huge tent wards holding 900 infected. Over 500 died at Upton alone. On the slowing the spread front, Copeland also tackled what he considered the biggest and least escapable dangers confronting still healthy New Yorkers, the concentration and circulation of residents. Nothing packed bodies together as dangerously as the mass transit system. Subway and elevated cars almost certainly contained infected passengers who couldn't afford to skip work and stay home. The most menacing moments of the day and night came during the morning and evening rush hours. To deconcentrate the crush, Copeland arranged with businesses to stagger work hours. White-collar offices would open at 8.40 a.m. and close at 4.30 p.m. Wholesalers would start their days earlier. Non-textile manufacturers would start later. Stores selling food and drugs were exempt. Other obvious con congestion points were schools and theaters, but where most American cities simply shut both down, Copeland went with a different strategy. Schools, he reasoned, were often more sanitary than housing, particularly in the slums. New York City schools, moreover, boasted a well-established system of child health monitoring and care. Copeland accordingly kept the schools open. Under the direction of Dr. S. Josephine Baker, head of the Department of Health's Bureau of Child Hygiene, school physicians inspected children each morning and sent sick students home. It worked. Few children caught the disease, and in addition, to the, in addition the schools handed out printed material on how to avoid the flu for passing along to parents. Theaters seemed a more unequivocal danger, but Copeland eschewed total closure. Many modern theaters were, after all, clean and well-ventilated and could be used to exhort audiences, urging them to adopt flu prevention measures. 
On October 11th, Copeland announced the approved venues could stay open if they did not allow patrons to cough, sneeze, or smoke. Dirty and stuffy hole-in-the-walls, as he called them, could be and were closed if they failed to meet sanitary standards. Public health education campaigns based on the city's experience with mitigating infectious diseases were another effort to slow the epidemic. By September 24th, at least 10,000 posters had been placed around the city in railway stations, elevated train platforms, ferry landings, streetcars, store windows, police precinct houses, hotels, and other places. They explained how the virus was transmitted and instructed the citizenry to cover their coughs and sneezes and to refrain from spitting. A small army of Boy Scouts was detailed to hand out printed cards to caught in the act spitters, reading, you are in violation of the sanitary code. They were backed up by the police, who rounded up New Yorkers caught spitting and brought them before courts in large numbers. On October 4th, 134 men were fined $1 each at the Jefferson Market Court. When it came to treating the infected, the terrible truth was that no effective medical intervention existed. Doctors were virtually helpless, but nurses were not. The best that could be done for the afflicted was to provide them with soups, baths, blankets, and fresh air until the disease subsided or the patient died, which could happen within 24 hours of onset. This enormous task was taken on by a large army of women commanded by the indefatigable Lillian Wald, who had pioneered the visiting nurse service that would now be writ large. Wald mobilized a multitude of nurses' organizations, church groups, municipal bureaucracies, civil entities, and social agencies into a nurses' emergency council. The group assembled volunteer nurses, a dangerous commitment. In October, roughly 20% came down with the disease and enlisted women who could support them by answering phones, accompanying them on, on home visits, and arranging for and driving automobiles to carry linens, pneumonia jackets, and quarts of soup. Responding to Wald's call were the Bureau of Communicable Diseases, the Bureau of Child Welfare, the Red Cross, the Maternity Centers, the Association for the Aid of Crippled Children, the Milk Stations, the New York Diet Kitchen, the Social Service Department of Mount Sinai, Presbyterian and Beth Israel Hop Hospitals, oh, Beth Israel, the Catholic Nursing Sisterhoods, the Salvation Army, the Teachers College Department of Nursing, and virtually every social settlement and social agency in the city. The Department of Health provided additional backup. On October 7th, Copeland established more than 150 emergency health centers in neighborhoods around the city whose chief function was to coordinate the work of nurses making home visits in their district. From October 26th onward, the number of deaths from both influenza and pneumonia first slackened, then swiftly declined. By early November, influenza and pneumonia fatality rates had returned to levels typical of the previous years, the crisis was over. More New Yorkers had died of disease in the city, roughly 30,000, than had died in World War I, about 7,500. This civilian military fatality ratio actually understated the dispar disparity because the flu had sickened millions of soldiers too. Of the 7,500 New York soldier deaths, more than 2,000 were due to disease. But New York civilian fatalities added relatively few to the cross totals, to the colossal totals that ravaged the United States, 675,000, to say nothing of the monstrous estimates of global deaths, at the very least 50 million, which reflected the very different social ecologies of India, China, and Russia, among others. Global flu would have been a far more apt name than Spanish. More pertinent is the fact that New York's death rate per 1,000 residents was 4.7, a figure dramatically lower than that of comparable cities. Boston's was 6.5 and Philadelphia's was 7.3. How to account for Gotham's relatively low mor mortality? Health Commissioner Royal Copeland had his critics then, and he has them now, but it's hard to avoid seeing his work as being a major contributing factor. Not only did he personally rise to the occasion, he was able to mobilize a constituency of distinguished public health activists. When asked in a New York Times postmortem interview to account for qualitative, quantitative results, Copeland attributed them to Gotham's long history of public health work, in particular its efforts to alleviate or eradicate epidemics, 
Beyond that, he was able to draw upon a mu the much bigger network of the civ city's civil society, social workers, labor unions, medical researchers, feminists, housing reformers, progressive activists of all kind, and these happily are resources we have with us still. We live in a very different historical moment. We have greatly improved medical and communication and organizational resources available for dealing with such a crisis. But it's worth remembering the alacrity with which the city's civil and political society rallied to grapple with a deadly menace. That's from Mike Wallace, um, the New York Times. Um, it's funny, I thought, I read something else today that talked about um, how we think that it's the end of the world, but actually we're just another, it's actually sort of pedestrian in the history of the world and of the pandemics just come and go. And these, you know, uh, these epidemics are part of our history. So it's not so much an apocalypse as we're just sort of like on track with history, which is a strange thing. Um, anyway, you know, I'm not in New York right now, but I know that New York is, uh, is dealing with this as well as can be possible. It seems like they're very, being very transparent and, um, you know, if I could be there, I would, um, anyway, that's just something I wanted to read because I thought it was worth reading in this time. It's a, it's a strange balance that we have to strike now where I want to... Because I read another article that was about like... Because look, this stuff is really important. The stay inside, um, social distance, wash your hands, don't touch your face. I did just wash my hands. Off. Uh, but... This stuff is really important, um, but it also can get a little bit crazy for me. Like I read another article about how you get it, um, and it was talking about how important social distancing was, but it went to this crazy thing about the amount of microbes on this door handle and that thing. And, you know, this guy, this young guy went to the bathroom and, and it clearly it was a, it was a scary article meant to scare young people who I don't think are scared enough because I don't think they think they're going to die. Um, but it was just too much. I mean, it was overwhelming uh, to me. So it's just, I have to strike this weird balance of being like, you know, I don't want sort of bullshit hope that isn't real and grounded in facts and truth, but I also don't need to be terrified any more than I already am about this whole thing. Um, so I think, you know, there's something very hopeful in that article and there's something very truthful just about the amount of carnage that this thing can, you know, just bulldoze through a culture. And then also, um, also the amount of strength that we can have around changing our ways and around like getting through this and uh you know this particular epidemic came and went it decimated the population uh, much worse than world war one which is extraordinary um and i think that we're looking at something right now that will decimate us it's certainly the most vulnerable and it is exposing how vulnerable the most vulnerable are in our society and how unfair that is and how tragic that is. Um, so anyway, I have to strike this balance of being not too freaked out and terrified to, you know, ever turn a door handle ever again. And also to not position myself in a thing where it's like, yeah, it's not that big a deal, you know, what, what you catch a cold? I'm like, uh, everybody's going to get it anyway. It's like, I don't think we can be cavalier because the numbers as they're coming in from Italy and you look at the graphs, you look at the trajectories, um, you know, and you think about the actual numbers, like 
I think it was 60 million people in Italy. And I know, I think it was like some, it was Merkel or something that predicted that 60% of any given country's population would get this. That's like what, like 35, 40 million people. And even conservatively, you take 1% of that who are going to die. Um, 1% of 40 million people is, uh, my math is not very good, but it's a lot of people. <laughs> 4 million would be 10%. So 400,000. 400,000 deaths, at which point it would peak, they think it's going to peak in Italy in what, June? So the numbers that we're seeing should rise to 200,000 till June and then come down from there till it hits 400,000. Those are pretty terrifying statistics. So I think that we have to, um, you know, be as responsible as we can to each other. Um, but also read about the survival of these, uh, you know, how people survived in cities and these other great pandemics, because I think it's very, it's nice to have facts of like both sides. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, let's talk about what you guys want to talk about for a second. My dude, have you gone out for a walk? I have gone out for a walk. I went out for a walk today. I know I look, I may not look so great. It may be the blue light of the computer. Um, or maybe all the stress, but I did go out for a walk. Um, I love you, David. I'm from Turkey. Uh, and we love you. I love you too, Turkey. How's Turkey doing with all of this? Um washing my hands right now awesome awesome wash your hands bring the phone into the bathroom everybody right i'll do it too come on let's go do it why not right i mean let's see i hope i'll have internet but let's go up to my bathroom and let's do the thing come on everybody you're all watching instagram on your phones i know you are i don't want to wake up that's all you can do is watch Instagram. Can you watch Instagram live on your actual computer? I don't think you can. I'm so tech savvy. Can you tell? There's some people sleeping up here. I don't want to wake them. Okay. Get in this bathroom here. Got a picture of uh, Che on the back there. I'm going to set this thing down right here. All right. What do we got? We got some nourishing lavender glycerin hand soap right here. And the backs of my hands are all chafed and horrible. I feel like these are gonna be, it's gonna be our lives. Uh, we gotta keep this out for a long time. So here we go. You know, I don't even, I do it different. You know, I see all these videos from the World Health Organization. Like I challenge you, hashtag wash your hands and everything. And this is how you do it. I do it different. I don't even turn on the faucet. I'm gonna be seeing these times you can still be a rebel. I mean, I'm not getting a sponsorship from the World Health Organization anytime soon, but I do have liquid soap, right? So it's easier. So, you know, if you had a bar of soap, this would be the dumbest thing you could ever do because you just get chalky white. You need to wet the bar of soap. But in terms of... Uh, uh, suds it up, says Shark Gore. I'm sudsing it up. I'm sudsing it up, right? Okay. You can't just do this though, right? You got to do this. Talk about Stranger Things now. All right, fine. Wash your hands and I will talk about it. Stranger Things, Stranger Things 4. Yeah, Chief Hopper trying to protect himself from coronavirus, not the Demogorgon. That is true. I'm trying to protect others from coronavirus, sir, sir or madam. This is how we protect others as well. I was trying to explain this to an eight-year-old today. That you know when you love someone and you kiss them and you go to your mom and you're like, oh, I love you. Oh, or your girlfriend, oh, I love you. This is in the modern world right now what it is to kiss someone. 
Okay? This is the most loving thing you can possibly do to other people right now. All right, so I lathered it up. I didn't even turn on the thing yet. This was far more than happy birthday twice. Did you guys see that? Miss anything? I washed my hands for 30 seconds. That's awesome. You're amazing, Carolina. All right, now we're going to turn on the tap. We're going to go in. I feel like this protective layer. Ah, the backs of my hands are... They're in pain already because I've washed my hands like... 10 times today already. And it's 8.17. Um, okay. So I do that. I do a little shake. Uh, there is a clean towel over here. I'm just going to do a little bit of dabbing on the clean towel. Look at that. We washed our hands. And, we t and we're talking about Stranger Things. Let's talk a little more about Stranger Things. What do you guys want to know? You want me to read? You want me to tell you what's up? Oh, man. I think because I was such a rebel and I didn't put the tab on first, I think that I... I think I got to wash them again because I think I got sticky. I just got to wet them again. Um... Yeah, Stranger Things for ooh yeah, Muscles versus the Taskmaster. That's a little Marvel movie, which uh, you know who knows when that'll come out. But yeah, that's uh, Red Guardian. Uh, you know, I can't wait for you guys to see that guy. Uh, talking Hopper style. Hopper, I don't know. Hopper's too difficult. Um, um, do you actually watch the show? Stranger Things? Do I actually watch the show? Yeah, I watch the show, Stranger Things. I love that show. That show is so good. Even my parts. I hate myself in so many things, and I actually think I'm okay in Stranger Things. Um, hi, Rachel and Alice. There you go. Say hi, Rachel and Alice. Please. We love you so much. Ah! Hi, Rachel and Alice. Uh, I love you, too. I, I just showed you how much I love you. Because I wash my hands. Um, when is it coming out? I don't know if Stranger Things... I don't know when Stranger Things 4 is coming out. It's going to be the new animated series on Netflix because we can't get together to shoot it. Because um, they're not letting groups of people come together. And I think that's a major concern too. Is like, if we all help each other, maybe we can uh, get through this thing in some kind of way. And if testing gets better, maybe we can figure out ways to get together again. But, um, you know... I really want to shoot the show. The scripts that I'm reading are beautiful, but right now, you know, we need to deal with this crisis until we can, um, until we can get back to shooting. So, yeah, um, I don't want crew to, you know, I don't want, I mean, I don't want anyone to be hospitalized or die as a result of this. Um, but, you know, the people that I know, of course, I don't want any of them to get sick. Um, um, I so love you. Love you too. Hello, Mr. Harbour. Hello. We must listen. It's true. We have to listen. Um, wash your hands to Soul Cycle on SNL. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, I, um, I was a wacky cocaine adult Soul Cycle instructor in. Uh, on SNL. Uh, and so if you want, you can put the YouTube on to that and wash your hands to that. And I can yell at you. And I think I say, what do I say? Like, cause I'm addicted to, to pushing myself and cocaine you could do wash your hands to that. Um, yeah, I could say hi, Faye. Hi, Faye. How are you? Uh, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Speaking of Spanish, I can't. Uh, best British food you've tried? It's the culinary delights right now. Uh, I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. Um, I had some soup today that was pretty good. Some like spinach soup. But it's not really a culinary tour of England right now. The supermarkets around us are, you know, we sort of, sort of like each day kind of, you know, each couple of days trying to take what what's there as opposed to like really making the best of a British thing. Um very much looking forward to seeing you in Black Widow. I'm very much looking forward to being in Black Widow if we ever are able to um release that movie. Um I would love to be able to watch that movie too. You know, I have not seen that movie. 
Uh, I've seen some stuff in ADR. It looks really good. And also, I was there when we were shooting it. And I'm really excited about it. But I would like to see it myself. Um, hell, I would watch it on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I stayed home. Hello. I love you. What's your favorite season of Stranger Things? My favorite season of Stranger Things is this season, season four. But um, we haven't shot all of it yet. Um, this season is very epic. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Grace. Uh, she loves you. That's very nice. Um, well, you know, I am realizing, guys, that as an actor, like the funny thing about me is that I'm made to feel all day like, you know, you guys need me. Uh, you know, because you have fans, you have people that watch a show and stuff, and you kind of get this narcissistic self-importance. And then it all kind of dwindles because we're in a pandemic and it all kind of goes away in a weird way. And then you realize that, like, it's me that needs you. And it's me that needs... Um, at my best self, it's me that needs to like create stuff for people. And I can only do that at a high level when I'm in groups of really good people. So, but I'm really appreciative of your support and I'm really appreciative of, um, you know, how you guys have made me feel over these last few years. It's been very important. So, Thank you. Um, and I may do some more of these. I like reading articles. Um, I may do some different stuff, maybe some Shakespeare and different stuff. And, you know, I'm sorry if some days are going to be more boring than others or some days are going to be more happy than others, some days are going to be more sad than others. But that's just sort of where we are right now. And hopefully you can accept me going through that stuff. Um, thank you guys for watching. And, uh, Take care, wait. Tiffany Music, I want to say hi to you because you love and support me. <laughs> and Bruno, and that's it. Okay, bye guys. Have a good night.